I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Big hour ahead, another big day in the big trial that we're covering on Court TV. And we refer to this as the Doomsday Prophet trial. We refer to Chad Daybell and his wife Lori as the Doomsday Couple. Why? Because they were part of this Doomsday cult. They were the leaders. They had people following them. You'll hear from them later in the trial. But you, you look at Lori and Chad and, you know, this this relationship was more it was about more than just a, a, a husband a wife cheating spouses sex there was this power element these people who were following them so again when you talk about the doomsday couple you're, you're talking about two people who were running a cult with followers so to understand it if you're the prosecution, you need someone who is in the middle of it all. You need someone who presumably has the inside information. And in this case, the person with the inside information in the middle of it all is Melanie Gibb. What an important witness. She was on the stand today. Um, and she's been... She's been with Chad and Lori in many different places and circumstances and really uh, very close. Here they are celebrating whatever they're celebrating. Chad and his, and his ladies, um, they're, they're praying together. They're doing all these things together. Now, we've heard from Melanie Gibb in different uh, scenarios. We've heard a police interview. Um, Melanie Gibb was on the stand back in 2020 in the preliminary hearing. We saw and heard her then. Um, she also testified in Lori's trial, but showed up in disguise, if you remember that. Yeah, that's her. Like, what's going on? What's with the disguise? Anyway, she wore a disguise last time. So um, she's really been, she's almost like the Forrest Gump of this trial. Like, anything important is happening, and she's there. She's there when Chad meets Lori. They were very friendly to each other, uh, very interactive, talking a lot um, about some of their ideas and beliefs that they had at that time. And so they were, um, I don't know, there was, a, there was a, a definitely attraction in the beginning, right from the beginning, so. She's also there when the group in this cult are casting some of their spells. Did you ever participate in any castings or observe them? Yes. Do you recall when that would have been? <sighs> Approximate, if you can remember. Probably January, February 2019 is my, yeah, after, you know, she learned that Charles was dark. So sometime after that. She also spent time at Lori's house seeing JJ perhaps on the, the end of his life, one of the last people to see him. Um, I mean, she is there all the time. Take a listen. I went to her door and knocked or I don't know if I knocked on it, but I tried to open her door and it was locked. So I went back to the room. Did she respond to your call or your text? No. Did Chad respond to any attempts to reach him? No. And that was the night of September 22nd? Correct. And that's the last night you saw JJ? That's correct. And then finally, when Lori gets caught and confronted by police about her missing son, JJ, again, Melanie Gibbs in the middle of it because she now is the person who was supposed to have JJ, according to Lori. <laughs> And don't forget, the first time she was contacted by police, she lied for Lori. So Melanie Gibb, an insider, a follower, a believer, and a friend. Here's the big moments from her testimony today. Had you ever met Lori's children? Yes. 
What observations, if any, did you make about her and Tylee? Um, they had a, um, a difficult relationship. Um, they didn't necessarily um, get along very well. Do you recall when Lori first started talking to you about people being becoming dark? I would say sometime between January and February of 2019. Do you recall the first person she talked to you about becoming dark? This the first specific person? Yes, it was it was Charles Bella. Did she tell you where she received that information? Yes, she received it from Chad. Do you recall sometime in July staying at Lori's residence? I do. And do you recall her asking you to leave at some point? Yes. So I woke up early in the morning and she told me I needed to leave because Charles was going to be coming down. He's driving in from Texas and that he was going to kill her. I believe she said uh, that Alex was going to be there to help protect her. Chad would share with Lori that um, his mission in life, according to what he learned, was to protect Lori. That was why he came here. So Chad had designated Alex as Lori's protector. That's right. And Lori was going to have Alex stay to protect her from Charles. I believe so. When you talk to Lori, it's just four days later. Any sign of sadness? No. Any sign of grief? No. How did she seem? Happy. I asked why weren't they getting a divorce, and she told me that if Chad were to seek after a divorce, that um, he would be in trouble with Jesus, that he would lose his exaltations. Did she ever talk to you about why she left to Arizona to go to Rexburg? Yes, she wanted to be with Chad and start their missions together. But there are people that are appointed to, or not appointed, but who are have the ability to have these visions, correct? Yes. And you believe that Chad Daybell at one point believed he could have these visions? Yes. I, I noticed that a lot of your testimony when you were talking about um, zombies and talking about uh, um, uh, information about various levels of light and dark, and, and quite and frankly, most of the subject, uh, was information that was conveyed to you by Lori. Would that be fair? Yes. When I listened to the tape, it sounded like Lori's responses were in the singular. I had to move her to somewhere else, talking about Tylee. It wasn't they had to move her, it was I had to move her. Do you recall that? Um, I believe so. Initially, when the um, investigation started over the um, disappearance of uh, JJ, you received a call from the police, correct? Right. And initially, it wasn't that you kind of lied, you lied to the police officers, remember that? Yeah, I do. So when you said you kind of maybe weren't truthful in the beginning, no, you, you lied to the police. Sure. Okay, so how did that play out then after you initially lied to the police? How did it play out that you then corrected yourself with law enforcement after your, your initial lie? I went to see them personally and talked to them about everything I knew. Well, the purpose of going back to the police was to tell them what you, that what you know, you felt they needed to hear, right? I felt an obligation to share everything I knew with them. Okay, and I guess that obligation wasn't so strong when you initially told the police the lie that you had JJ, right? It was a conflict within me. Always a problem when one of your key witnesses admits to lying. But the jury um, found Lori guilty. She testified at that trial and admitted the lie. So we'll see what happens here. Let's bring in our special guest joining us tonight, host of the Tylee and JJ's Silver Linings podcast and author of the book, Lori's Lies and Family Ties. He's also the brother of Lori Vallow, Adam Cox. Adam, thanks again uh, for coming back and seeing us tonight. Um, let me start here because Melanie Gibb, I believe, also did a podcast and would do podcasts with your sister, Lori. Did, I'm curious, did you ever listen to those podcasts? No, never. I've never listened to any podcast of Lori's or any of the podcasts that she tried to get a lot of people to listen to, other people as well. So I have no idea what goes on in those podcasts or heard anything on those. But she, she wanted you to listen, right? 
Oh yeah, she uh, she wanted to get as many people to listen to her on on her podcast, and I think on other uh, podcasts that were similar to it. But um, I n no interest in that for me. How would you describe this relationship between Lori and Melanie Gibb? This is interesting. Um, I never met Melanie Gibb. Um, but from what I understand from other family members, apparently other family members didn't get along or like Melanie Gibb. They thought that she was over the top. Um, Lori and her were super tight. They talked all the time. They were always together um, from what other people have said. So um, I'm sure that, you know, obviously when, when Melanie Gibb lies to the police because she doesn't want to get in trouble, I'm, I, I think that could be normal. But the fact that she spent more time with Lori and was involved in all this nonsense, uh, I'm sure that she has a lot of credible things that were said. When you, you mentioned over the top, what, what do you mean over the top? What, were, what was the family saying about Melanie Gibb being over the top? Oh, just that she was, oh, sorry. Um, just that she was um, like, like whatever Lori wanted, she was there. And then she um, had like, you know, her own weird vibes, um, according to some family members, um, that she would um, just rub them the wrong way um, and be over the top kind of stuff, over the top as far as saying certain things or trying to hug them and I don't know, just kind of a weird, uh, a weird feeling for a lot of people uh, that knew her from my family. I think uh, that description is great because I think a lot of people can relate to that, come across people like that, that are like, oh, well, oh, oh, well, we just met here. Like, let's, yeah. let's kick it down just a notch. Um, do you have any idea how deep she was into all of this? Because, you know, we've been talking the doomsday cult, the doomsday cult, the prophet Chad, um, Lori and Chad leading these people. Um, any idea how deep Melanie was into all of this and all these beliefs? I mean, it's hard to say, but I mean, from how things went and Lori, uh, I get obviously Lori and Chad did their own secret things together. Um, but if there was one person or maybe even two, I don't know, I've never met Zulema either, but, um, that I think that there, there's a core group there. Like Melanie Gibb probably knew a lot of stuff. Uh, they all were believing in Chad's nonsense. So, um, I'm, I, I want to say she knew a lot. Now, when it comes to killing the kids and killing Charles, I don't know who knew that and who didn't know that. That's, and that's something I, I hope that we can find out in either this trial or in Lori's trial coming up, um, who knew what. And I don't know if we're ever going to get that answer. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is what they knew and, and how they spoke about it, right? If you're, if you're doing castings and things happen, oh, things happen. You know, we had a vision versus like a vision versus premeditation, right? It's a fine line in this case between those two things. Um, one thing um, that she talked about today was this relationship between Lori and, and Tylee. She described as being very difficult. Um, what are your thoughts about the relationship of your sister and, and, and your niece, Tylee? That's also another difficult thing to assess. Um, of course, Tylee being a teenager um, and maybe seeing a lot of Lori's changes because she's with her all the time and maybe saying, you know, I, I don't know this to be fact, but I would think that at some point Tylee must have said, mom, what are you doing? This is crazy. Or, or, you know, and I'm sure Lori's trying to get her on board. And obviously if Lori, if you don't go on board with what Lori was saying, she cut you off. Like she cut me off that the night that, uh, that she told me she was turning into a translated being. And I said, uh, well, that's not true. And she goes, you think I'm crazy. And I was like, no, I don't know if you're crazy, but what you're telling me is not true. That was the cutoff moment for me and Lori. I don't know with Tylee, with Tylee probably, you know, would say certain things to her. And, and Tylee had, was strong-willed. 
And, um, you know, there's teenage kids that argue with their mom. But if Chad is telling Lori that Tylee is a dark spirit and Lori's telling Tylee that you're a dark spirit, what are you going to do as a teenage kid? Uh, what kind of thoughts go to your mind? So, and Tylee never spoke to me about it. I really wish that she would have um, about what she was going through and what was going on. But at that point, who knew how things were going with, with Lori and with Chad, you know, telling everybody these dark spirits that were turning into zombies. I mean, it, when you talk about it, it sounds like the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard in your life. How anybody in the right mind could go along with any of it is beyond me but i feel tylee and Lori's relationship probably got a little bumpier once chad got into the uh the situation Lori and jj when so Lori adopted jj with, with charles and this was um and and you know jj's grandparents were excited that's what they wanted they they trusted and believed in Lori at that time um, how much time were you spending with Lori back then when she first adopted JJ and took this and adopted this uh, special little little boy and decided, yeah, I, I, he's going to be my son and I'm going to take care of him and, and I'm going to, uh, Charles and I are going to raise this little guy. Uh, a pretty much fair, fair amount of time. Um, I never lived by my family. I was always a radio DJ all over the country. So I would come in for Christmas and, you know, sometimes for birthdays and then the summer and vacations and things like that. So I was around them enough to see on a, you know, on a, on a 14 day straight, you know, process of watching how things are going on with her and her relationships with her kids. And um, yeah, she was a great mom to JJ, no doubt about it. Loved him, taught him. Like when she first got JJ, they told him he was, you know, extreme autism. Like he wouldn't be able to do these certain things. And Lori spent hours and hours of working with him and, and helping him. And he just, every time he just made leaps and bounds of being where they never thought he was going to be. So, you know, during that time, uh, Lori just, she went over, bent herself over backwards to make sure JJ got everything that he needed and wanted. Yeah, such a tragedy that that Lori disappeared. That that Lori yeah. disappeared. Um, could have been so much. <sighs> Two children would be with us. Uh, Adam Cox, appreciate your time. Uh, Tylee and JJ Silver Linings podcast and the book Lori's Lies and Family Ties. Uh, great to see you. We'll see you again soon. Thanks so much. You got it. When we come back, Melanie Gibb admitted lying. What is our think tank? Think of Melanie Gibb while they're here. Eklund Mercy, Kirk Nerman, Nima Romani, up next. We are underway in the trial of doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Lori, I can ever come up with this. His wife, Lori Vallow Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. It's the doomsday prophet Chad Daybell on trial. I do believe people can see things. I believe I, it's possible. I but my feeling right. about them is I think they can conjure up ideas and thoughts. Like I was sitting with Lori in the temple and we just hold hands because we just love each other. And she said, oh, Heavenly Father and Mother came to me right here, Melanie. And they were talking to me. And I was like, I didn't think she was lying in the temple. I never thought she was making this stuff up. I was like, but on the eternal thing, I think that guy wanted me to be a witness for all this, so, and that's a whole different discussion, but um, somebody needed to be a witness to all this craziness. That's Melanie Gibb in her police interview. And, and from her perspective, like, why she was in the middle of this is that God wanted her to be a witness to all of this craziness. And when, when, I, when we say craziness, we mean, oh, oh, like mass murder or serial murder. Like, this is... She's in the middle of this. She's at all the important points of everything happening here. 
including, I think it was the makeout session um, between Chad and Lori over on the BYU campus in Idaho. Mm. Glad I wasn't there. Let's bring in our think tank. Joining us tonight in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney Eklund Mercy. Also with us tonight in Phoenix, Arizona, criminal defense attorney. And the man who represented <laughs> Kirk Nurmi. And in Los Angeles, California, president of the West Coast Trial Lawyers and former federal prosecutor Nima Romani. And no, they're not, they're not in some sort of war with the East Coast Trial Lawyers. There's no East Coast, <laughs> West Coast thing going on there. All right, great to see everyone tonight. Eklund, let's talk about Melanie Gibb. Um, she's there at all these significant moments, but she was like a member of this, of this following of Chad Daybell. That's why she's in the middle of all this, and she's like buddies, buddies with, with Lori Daybell. Uh, up until the point that she lies to police, and then everything turns in that moment. Um, do you believe? Do you believe her testimony? No, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't believe anything she says. I mm. think she is the problem. I think a lot of things. I think a lot of answers could come from her. I think that the prosecution missed an opportunity to press her to see what actually happened to the children, and I think that you think she knows who, more. You think she knows more than she is letting on absolutely. here. Absolutely. And and the thing is, she's able to cherry pick whatever she needs to, to, to get people off her scent. To be that close to the point in which you know intimate stories, but you have no idea what happened to children. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I no, we're not buying it. Kirk Nurmi, is there a way that the defense of Chad Daybell can use Melanie Gibb to help their case? Yeah, I think we're seeing it. I think we saw it here uh, this afternoon on Court TV when she was on the stand. You know, you mentioned in the lead in, Vinny, you talked about the power dynamic. And I think the power dynamic is really crucial to this case, especially when we talk about the life of Chad Daybell, what's really at stake here, right? And we heard Melanie give, and I share Eklund's suspicion that she knows more than she's letting on, who was willing to lie for Lori, who the defense brought out that, uh, you know, talked mostly to Lori about these dark spirits and everything. We talked about, we just saw her attachment to Lori at church and what have you, right? And this goes to this power dynamic of, did Lori and her brother, who we know killed her, Lori's husband, Mr. Vallow, did they kind of hijack the, the, the cult that Chad built in order to effectuate their ends to it? Did they kind of take the wheel? Did they have the power? And if the jury believes that Lori and Alex had the power, that could go a long way to aiding Chad's quest for a life verdict at the end of this. Nima Romani, what if the jury believe, and so Chad is the one, and we heard some of this testimony, Chad decides who's a dark spirit, who's a light spirit, right? Yes. But then he's hands off. Let's say the jury believes that he's making these decisions and he's hands off, and he kind of knows that Lori might act on it, although he didn't like sit down and have the conversation with her about doing anything. But he knew that Lori and Crazy Alex would act upon his declarations of light and dark. Does that make him guilty? Legally? Yeah, a conspiracy? Le no, no, Vinny, but come on. What, what kind of world do we live in? We all know that Chad Daybell played an integral role in all this, and there's a financial motive, and they're uh, vacationing in Hawaii, and he takes off when they're digging up the bodies. So, yeah, in a law school hypothetical, if Chad just tells Lori that, you know, these are dark spirits and, and sends Lori on her way, Chad isn't a co-conspirator, he's not an accomplice, he's not an accessory, he's not any of those legal things that would make him liable under criminal law. But he did a lot more than that, Vinny. We know that. Well, he was hanging by the pool. He had a bag mm -hmm. of money from the insurance from the death of his wife, Tammy, and he had his new wife uh, right next to him. And yeah. this, is, this is still, to me, this, this image is, is this whole case, Eklund Mercy. Because this is the moment when everyone else in the world is looking for the kids. They're buried in his backyard, and, and they're her children, and she's got nothing to say. And this may be a moment in which Melanie Gibb also also saw and also is, was trying to stop as well. I just, I, I am baffled that nobody really 
is pressing Melanie as a co-conspirator or as a co-defendant. Like, I, I'm really shocked. For her to be that close, for her to see all of the intimate details, for her to just, you know, you're, you're drinking the Kool-Aid as well, and you then have nothing. We have a whole blind spot in which she'll, I need, yeah, I need answers. I need answers. Like, that, that, that makes no sense to me. Um, Kirk, I'm trying to, like, for, for the defense in this case, obviously they're, they're putting everything on Lori and Alex. Lori and Alex, Lori and Alex. I, I just don't see how Lori is closer to Alex than she is to Chad, right? I mean, Chad and her get married. Chad and her go to Hawaii. Chad and her are making out on the BYU campus, right? So, like, they are, this is them. And, and, and he's trying to, like, separate them and stick, stick Lori with, with Alex. And it's just not happening. It's just not happening. I, I mean, I know that she jumped on him and simulated a sex act, but that was years ago. That was years ago when Alex was married to someone else. But, like, it seems that Chad and Lori are inseparable from my perspective. Yeah, but at the same time, Vinny, you know, she's got this weird relationship with her brother who she's known her whole life, right? So you could make the argument that the, the, the relationship she has with Alex is more trusting, more genuine. She knows him, she trusts him, what have you. She trusted him to kill her husband, right? And not implicate her. So that's a pretty big level of trust that she's showing in her brother. So I think you can make the same argument because uh, Chad's husband number four, he could, you know, she could be on the husband number five down the road. So you can make the argument that she's closer to Alex than she has to any of her husbands. Yeah, there are five, uh, five husbands. Um, Nima, Lori Daybell's nowhere near this trial. She's in Arizona. She's closer to Kirk tonight than she is to this trial. Um, would it be interesting to hear her testimony in this case? Like, that would be very interesting. If, like, I thought there's a slight possibility, slight, that she would show up and exonerate Chad because she's so in love with him, you know? So that was the surprise witness I was waiting for to walk through those courtroom doors because we know how smitten she is and we all believe that he was the one that was sort of manipulating her and controlling this. Obviously, she has her role to play and she's absolutely responsible for the murder of her children. But I thought there was that possibility that she would show up, take the fall, and try to exonerate Chad, but it uh, looks like that's not going to happen. Yeah, to me, that would be the ultimate wild card because that would, like, have the jurors' heads spinning around.